If I asked you to name a film from the early 1990s that featured groundbreaking visual effects that changed the landscape of cinema, you'd probably answer with something like Terminator 2 or Jurassic Park. But what if I told you that instead of bringing dinosaurs back to life, an even earlier pioneer in visual effects was a satirical black comedy involving Meryl Streep, Goldie Hawn, and a magical potion? Yep, that's right. The film does indeed exist and is none other than Death Becomes Her. Directed by the legendary Robert Zemeckis and co-written by David Kep and Martin Donovan, the idea came to Kep back when he was working on another film which featured a story about a man attempting to kill his wife. But she's a witch and part of the reason you murder her is because she's this horrible witch in the literal sense, but she doesn't die. And of course, the witch has an axe to grind now that she knows her husband tried to off her. Oh, clever little witch. That basic concept later developed into Death Becomes Her, which centers on two old friends who actually despise each other very much. For real, Frenemies is putting it mildly. On guard, <laughs> bitch. The two adversaries have been engaged in a long-standing feud, and once they drink the magic potion that promises eternal youth with some unpleasant side effects, I can see my ass. <gasps> There's something really wrong with your neck, too. Their rivalry is taken to new extremes. Meryl Streep kills it, as usual, as narcissistic, youth-obsessed actor Madeline Ashton. For real, the opening of this film wants us to believe her Broadway musical adaptation of Tennessee Williams' Sweet Bird of Youth is terrible, but Streep is simply too good of a performer for that to ring true. A nice little thematic detail, that play is about an aging actress who pines for her lost youth. Goldie Hawn co-stars as Helen Sharp, a high-strung writer whose greatest fear is that Madeline will steal her latest man from her. That man in question is Bruce Willis's Dr. Ernest Menville, who instantly is taken with Madeline and in one quick cut, leaves Helen for her, sending Helen spiraling into a crazy cat lady, complete with a fat suit. Another great little detail is that the leading ladies' nicknames for each other are Mad and Hell. Mad? Hell! Okay, so all three of the leads in this film are exceptional, with Bruce Willis cast against type here, and his performance almost steals the show. Before Willis was cast, Kevin Kline was the first choice for the role. However, he exited the project due to a pay dispute with the studio. Actors Jeff Bridges and Nick Nolte were both considered for the part before Willis was ultimately cast. For more? She'll be furious! Isabella Rossellini stars as the devilish Liesel von Ruman, who somehow has a steady supply of the potion. One of her more recent roles was in A24's Marcel the Shell with Shoes On as the voice of Nana Connie, Marcel's grandmother. In an early draft of the script, Liesel was implied to be Cleopatra, which explains the Egyptian-themed box that the potion comes in. In another draft, there wasn't actually any potion, but rather a demon named Bert that is passed on to hosts who in turn receive the power of immortality. In that version, Liesel actually tricks Madeline to becoming Bert's new host by selling her on the idea of being forever young. Ian Ogilvy as Chagall, the mysterious man who refers Madeline to Liesel. Weirdo. The actor was also concerned for the role of James Bond back in the early 80s. Academy Award winner Sidney Pollock has a cameo as the ER doctor examining Madeline after her tumble down the stairs. His scene is hands down one of my favorites. His physical comedy is really good. The actor was well known for directing Out of Africa, also starring Meryl Streep, as well as appearances in productions like The Sopranos. In the psychiatric clinic scene clearly inspired by One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Deborah Jo Rupp plays one of the psychiatric patients. You'll also recognize her as Kitty Foreman from That 70s Show and its reboot, That 90s Show. Lastly, Fabio, an actor slash model, and not the other way around, as well as a star of Zoolander, plays one of Liesel's bodyguards. Filming commenced on December 9, 1991, lasting until April 7, 1992. The entire film was shot in Los Angeles and featured numerous locations frequently used in film and television, such as the Greystone Mansion and the Abel of Los Angeles. 
The final shot where Helen and Madeline fall down some stairs outside the chapel was filmed at Mount St. Mary's University in Brentwood. The exterior of Madeline and Ernest's mansion is located in San Marino, but the interior was a set built on a soundstage. There is definitely some material other than body parts left on the cutting room floor. The theatrical version of Death Becomes Her removed or shortened several scenes that existed in the rough cut. Robert Zemeckis decided this was necessary to speed up the pacing of the film and eliminate extraneous jokes. Most drastically, the original ending was entirely reshot after test audiences reacted negatively to it. Excuse me. That version followed Ernest after he fled Liesel's party, meeting a bartender named Tony, played by Tracy Ullman, who helps him fake his death to avoid Mad, Helen, and Liesel. Now he's dead. He's dead? Ernest is dead? Everybody's dead! The two women encounter Ernest and the bartender 27 years later, happily retired as a couple while Madeline and Helen seem to not be enjoying their eternal existence. As Ernest and his wife get into their car and drive away, Mad and Helen realize that it's Ernest and chase after them only to be hit by an oncoming car and break into a bunch of pieces. Zemeckis thought this ending was too happy and opted for a darker ending seen in the final cut. Ullman was one of a few actors with speaking roles to be removed even though she remained in the trailer. Zemeckis made the wise choice to go with the bleaker ending because it's the perfect capper for this warped story. Ernest lived a long, happy life while Hell and Mad are doomed to spend eternity together. Do you remember where you parked the car? You can catch a glimpse of this original ending from the picture of old Ernest at the funeral which is actually Bruce Willis in full old age makeup, but composited onto a photo of a mountain climber. In another unreleased deleted scene, Ernest and Madeline's housekeeper Rose goes to the kitchen and finds Madeline in the freezer. Madeline tells her to close the door and Rose, horrified, runs away screaming. This is followed by Ernest removing a frozen Madeline from the freezer he stored her in and dragging her upstairs. I'm so sweaty. I don't think it's sweat, honey. I think you're defrosting. Other scenes that were eliminated were Mad talking to her agent played by Jonathan Silverman, and another with the doctor mistaking Madeline for a corpse and shutting her eyes after she faints in the ER room. None of these scenes have been released fully to the public, but you can still see bits and pieces of these in the original theatrical trailer. For the time, the visual effects were groundbreaking, not to mention bone-breaking and represent a giant leap forward in the application of computer-generated effects. This film marked the first time that the texture of human skin was CGI, with the wizards over at Industrial Light and Magic handling the VFX. Here's that exact shot. As for the shot where Madeline's head is dislocated and facing backwards, that involved a combination of Meryl Streep wearing a blue screen hood over her head while walking backward, and prosthetic makeup on street to create the effect of a twisted neck. For the effect where Meryl Streep's breasts become higher and firmer after drinking the potion, a pneumatic bra was built. But the results didn't look realistic enough. In order to get the shot, Streep's dresser stood behind her out of sight of the camera and pushed her breasts into position. It's a miracle! It's another miracle! That said, the production had its fair share of mishaps. In the scene where Madeline and Helen are fighting with shovels, Streep accidentally cut Goldie Hawn's face, leaving a faint scar. Streep also admitted that she disliked working on a project that focused so heavily on special effects and vowed never to work on another film like that again. In an interview with Entertainment Weekly, she said it was like being at the dentist. Before the film was fully finished, they were still workshopping the title. Bruce Willis had a couple suggestions himself. I was gonna call it like, it's death baby, or my man death. Obviously, neither title stuck. Death Becomes Her was released in the summer on July 31st, 1992. It opened the number one at the box office with $12 million. While receiving mixed reviews from critics, the film was a commercial success, grossing $149 million worldwide against a $55 million budget. 
While most reviews agree that the performances and innovative special effects are the film's biggest strengths, some didn't really appreciate the satirical elements. Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel both gave Death Becomes Her a thumbs down, noting that while the film had great special effects, it lacked any real substance or character depth. No character depth? I mean, just look at this depth! <laughs> Teach their own, I suppose. Even if they're wrong... I'm gonna get a second pigeon. <laughs> Doctor. No one can deny that the special effects were cutting edge at the time, and it earned the film the Academy Award for Best Visual Effects, beating out Alien 3 and Batman Returns. These are the moments that make life worth living. The digital advancements on Death Becomes Her would be incorporated into ILM's next project, Jurassic Park, released by Universal only a year later. Speaking of things Jurassic Park borrowed from this film, the line, Hold on to your butts was actually something director Robert Zemeckis would say while shooting, so screenwriter David Kep worked that into the script. 20 years after the film's release, in 2012, there was talk about a possible spin-off on Bravo. Nothing ever developed further than that, though. In December 2017, Kristen Chenoweth was announced to be starring as Madeline Ashton in a Broadway musical adaptation of Death Becomes Her. I'd be lying if I said I didn't want to see her and Adina Menzel as Helen Sharp square off. The film also has acquired a significant cult following, especially in the LGBTQ community. So, if you happen to be watching this in June, happy Pride Month! While the film failed to find an audience during its initial theatrical run, perhaps due to how cutting and cynical it is, its legacy has endured thanks to fans like those in the queer community who continue to put on midnight screenings. The score by Alan Silvestri never fails to impress and hits all of the right melodramatic notes. The gothic production design of Hollywood underscores the Faustian bargain elements, and the pitch-perfect campy performances nail the tone of this film. Now a warning. Now a warning? On top of that, this film includes some of the best visual gags Zemeckis has ever put to celluloid. So unlike Helen and Madeline, this film has aged exceptionally well. Oh yeah, you're all runny. Okay, well, maybe everything except for the fat suit. That's a little too broad for this otherwise sharp satire. Even though its themes are really dark and sinister, I mean, there's a reason Zemeckis immediately went on to helm the feel-good Force Gump the very next year. The film is still extremely comical, and once the plot gets going, it almost functions as a live-action cartoon. And we know how much Robert Zemeckis loves his cartoons. I mean, just look at Goldie Hawn in this scene. She's basically the real-life Jessica Rabbit. Ooh, while we're talking about references to previous Zemeckis productions, another one is when Helen mentions drinking the potion on October 26, 1985, which Back to the Future fans will recognize as the date that Marty travels back to 1955. Anywho, the moral of the story may be that pining for eternal youth is a crazy idea as it's more of a curse than a blessing. And also that it's never too late to change direction in life and start fresh, as evident by the tender eulogy for Ernest. Well, maybe a little too late for hell and mad. Blah, 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 blah. And with that, I give Death Becomes Her 4 out of 5 cans of spray paint. As always, thanks for watching, and be careful what you wish for. Okay, what's this, uh, what's this you're talking about with your neck? Well, what's the problem with your neck, first so? one, I kind of turn it, you know? Maybe you, maybe you just did. Oh! Okay, right, I see. Uh, gotcha.